Welcome to Crosslink Community Church Podcast, where we prize Jesus, make disciples, and love people well. We are so glad you're here, and wherever you're listening from, we believe you will be more acquainted with the heartbeat of God through today's message. Good morning. It's snowing. Enough said. (laughs) Wasn't it just last week it was sunny and warm? Told you guys shouldn't have came to church. Should have enjoyed the weather. Now it's cold and snowy for the next eight months. <laughs> but that's good. All right. Uh, I'm actually I'm good with the cold and snowy until uh, uh, until February. So uh, we'll start praying fervently in January that um, God will send us warm weather by January or February. We'll be happy. Um, other than that, I like I like the cold weather for the holidays. Uh, in fact, when we lived in Florida for uh, uh, my childhood, and then um, when I moved my wife there. Um, Without her decisions, we went there anyways. And I realized how, how much I do like the seasons. And then when you're here and you realize that the snowy season is just forever long, it's like, this is crazy. Um, but anyways, enough about that. We, we are in our last week, our last verse um, that uh, we're going to deal with um, this morning. I, and I went back and forth, I'm not going to lie. I went back and forth on whether or not I was going to do this one um, because it's a precious verse to many. Uh, and it is a beautiful verse, an amazing verse. I love this verse. It's steeped in God. God's promises. It's steeped in his um, kind of love towards his people. But I do think, I, I, would, I would contend that we tend to use the, even this one out of, out of context. And so my goal this morning is to maybe build out some context around it. Um, I, I don't know about you. Uh, I, when, when I moved um, to Florida uh, in 2004, Back to Florida, I brought my uh, Krista there. We we went and uh, we we went through a lot of difficult seasons in church. A- anyone ever have a difficult season in church? <laughs> I'm I'm not po- I'm I'm pointing people out. People from Steubenville, Ohio, in the house, friends of ours. Hey, it's good to see you. <laughs> people are like, I'm not showing up at that church. He calls people out. So. God. Anyway, so I, when, when we went, to, it, was, it was just good to see that. Anyways, when we uh, went to Florida, um, it, we, we went through a couple difficult things um, when it came to church. And then uh, we found we found our place at this church called Mortal Life Ministries. Uh, it was a church start, church plant. Um, there was about 50 people there when we started. And um, and my wife and I went there, and it was a place of healing for us. Like, it, it just, uh, we didn't expe- expect to go through the healing that we went through. Um, and we also didn't expect um, to... Uh, uh, heal from the things that, that we didn't know we were carrying around. Like there were some things in us that we didn't know we really had that we had to heal from. And, and one of those things you carry around with you, when you kind of navigate the inner circles of church, uh, you see a lot of things. You see things happen. It's hard sometimes. There's different personalities. It's just a difficult thing to deal with. And so what ends up happening is um, people grow sometimes pretty bitter towards church. Um, and if they don't get bitter towards church because of what they've seen, they grow bitter towards church because of what they've experienced. What I mean is that maybe God didn't answer the prayer that you wanted. Or maybe God didn't come through in the situation that you were trying to get him to come through with. Or maybe he, in some ways, failed you. And even though we sung a song that's very specific uh, about that uh, he can be trusted, he is not finished yet, that in our own minds, our own circumstances, in our own worlds, there have been scenarios and moments at which it seems like God has let you down. And so what happens is you start to grow in this distance between you and God, you and church, you and people who are supposed to encourage love and motivate you to go deeper with Jesus, you kind of pull away from. And I think one of those areas that I think creates some of this um, is either our expectations or experiences when it comes to prayer. We come to God with certain lists, correct? Correct. You have a list? Okay. Uh, you want certain things to happen. You want God to come through in certain areas of your life. And, and so maybe, maybe your list is not 
very selfish. Maybe you're trying to like pray for other people. Maybe your list is incredibly selfish. You're like, I just want good things in my life. Either way, you approach God, you're like, here's, here's what I want you to do. And, and what ends up happening is that you and I start to think that, okay, in order to get God to move towards the direction I need him to move, then I, I need to do um, X, Y, and Z. And if I do this and then I pray, then he's going to come through and he's going to make sure everything aligns the way that I have determined it to align. And this is how we want God to move, but this is not often how he moves. Um, so if you have your Bibles, can you turn with me to Second Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14? You're like, no, not that verse. Yep, that one. That one it is. Uh, ever since 2020, um, this is a verse you've seen, you've heard, you've probably seen it on uh, church signs, on Facebook, um, in places where this very beautiful, listen to me, very beautiful verse is used, especially when things go awry, when things are messy, when the world is falling, when we're out of control. We finally come to the conclusion that I'm not in control of my circumstances. And then what ends up happening is we go to a verse like this and we say, okay, here's the equation. Here's what I need to do. And if I do this, then God is going to then help me out of this mess or our nation out of this mess. If we just do what it says here in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14, let us read it together. This is what it says. If my people who are called by my name, humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sin and heal their land. Man, what a beautiful verse. So you're saying all, all we have to do um, is uh, seek God, humble ourselves, pray, whatever that looks like, talking to God, um, turn from our wicked ways, uh, and then God will respond and heal our land and forgive our sins. So this is what we have to do. This is application for you and I. The, the problem is, I, I don't know if this verse was for us today. Now, now, before you get angry at me and leave, you can't. We locked the doors. I told them to. Um, there are many things in this text, in this verse, principles that apply very beautifully to us today. But you have to wait to the end to hear that. First, let's deal with some of the context. Who is this verse for? If you don't know the backstory, Solomon is here. He just dismissed the people after the building of the temple. God was finally going to have a place that the people wanted for him to reside, to rest on, a place for them to go and commune with him. And so David wanted to build the temple. David didn't get to build the temple, but his son Solomon did. So Solomon built the temple. There there was this prayer over the temple to consecrate it. The people were there. The people were dismissed. And then Solomon had a moment with God. Now, what you and I need to understand is that when it says here in verse 14, if my people, if my people who are called by my name, this verse is directly, specifically talking to Israel in this moment. Now, now, we'll get to how this kind of factors in with us who have been grafted into Israel's line because of the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. We'll get to that. But right now, what we need to understand in the context of this verse is that God is talking about his people, his nation, Israel. And I think we need to read a few verses before and after to build out what is fully going on. So if you would, we're going to look at verse 11. It says this, Thus Solomon finished the house of the Lord and the king's house. All that Solomon had planned to do in the house of the Lord and in his own house, he successfully accomplished. <laughs> this is interesting. God, I got your house built and I got, got some stuff for me too. Okay. Anyways, you guys awake? Okay, all right. Verse 12, then the Lord appeared to Solomon in the night. And he said to him, I have heard your prayer and have chosen this place for myself 
as a house of sacrifice. Now that's, that's good news. If you don't know the system of the Old Testament, then you wouldn't understand how good, how much of a good news that is to Solomon. Because what the people needed uh, in their sinfulness was a place to go to offer a sacrifice so that their sins would be atoned for. And God is saying to Solomon right now, okay, I, I have heard your prayer. This temple will be sufficient. I will reside there. It will be at that place at which sacrifices will be made to atone my people's sins. And so this is good news because based on the kind of old covenant, the Old Testament understanding of Israel and God, their relationship to God was based on their obedience. The more they obeyed, the closer they were to God, the more they were blessed. The more they disobeyed, the further they got from God and they had curses that would lay upon them. And the only way to deal with that distance in that disobedience was to offer a sacrifice so that the sins would be atoned because what has proven true in all of humanity is that you and I do a really bad job with obedience. Some of you A-typers, I'm like, no, I don't. I'm like, okay. Like we, I don't care how A-type you are. There are certain rules that even you will break. What ends up happening is that we understand through the law that it is impossible for us to perfectly obey what was needed so that I would be holy enough before a righteous, holy God. So I can't do it. So what God did is set up a system to reveal to you and I, to all of humanity, that it was a disgusting process to deal with our disgusting sin. And that means they brought an animal to be blood sacrificed on the altar. The only way to atone the sins of his people. And God is saying to Solomon, this place is acceptable. Verse 13, I need you to see this because this is a different perspective, a vantage point, maybe a verse that's not included when we quote 14. Remember, God is speaking here. He says this, when, when I shut up the heavens so there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people. Uh, uh, God, why, why, would you, why would you do that? <laughs> you see, what ends up happening is that we tend to approach this text when everything's out of control in efforts to try to regain control by controlling God. But when we actually approach this text and its context, we find out that God was never actually out of control. He was in control the whole time. We just didn't like what he was controlling. But because... It was obedience-based, and because Israel had this issue that they would chase after foreign gods and other things more than God, there was consequences, and these consequences came by way of famine, by way of locusts, by way of pestilence. And God is saying, if this happens, when this happens, you need to know that I'm a part of that. And second, Israel needs to do this. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now my eyes will be opened and my ears attentive to the prayer that is made in this place. For now I have chosen and consecrated this house that my name may be in forever. My eyes and my heart will be there for all time. And as for you, if you will walk before me as David your father walked, doing according to all that I have commanded you and keeping my statutes and rules, then, then I will establish your th royal throne as I have covenant to you with David your father, saying, you shall not lack a man to rule Israel. Now, I don't, I don't know about you, um, but if you ever have this like direct line to God where the communication to him is so vivid, so clear, it's you are talking to him in this moment, Solomon, hearing the very words of the Lord saying, this is what you need to do. Follow my way and good things will happen. Um, but it just took two years under the leadership of Solomon for everything to go awry. Two years. 
hearing directly from God. This is, this is what you need to be aware of. This is the place I will commune with you, my people. This is the place where sacrifices will be made. This is the place where you get to worship me, your creator. This is the place, and you just need to obey my ways. And just in a two short year time span, everything went crazy. So what happens is when things go awry, what God expected of his people was to finally come to a place where they are not God, he is. They need to humble themselves and seek his face. And this prayer that's referenced here is a prayer of repentance. Literally like, we're sorry we have gone this way. We are now in this prayer telling you, declaring to you, we are going to follow you. And do you know how many times they did this? Over and over and over again. It does beg the question, so we're not throwing stones at Israel. How many times do we pray similar things? Not this time. God, I've learned my lesson. If you can get me out of this situation again, I know I asked you three times ago, but this time I mean it. Can you help? Like we do the same thing over and over and over again. And so what I want to explain to us here today is that this particular verse, uh, 2 Chronicles 7, 14, isn't for us to do so that God acts because he says that's what he's going to do. What this verse is about is to kind of instill in you and I these principles of how we can approach God. But before we get there, you need to understand just saying this prayer doesn't cause God to move like a genie in a bottle. And that's typically what we want. The other thing that we need to understand on how this is different for Israel than it is for us is that when God is talking about his people, talking about Israel, and talking about Israel's repentance, he's talking about a national repentance, not simply a righteous remnant. Okay, if just a few handful Hundred people will pray and seek my face. Then I will hear their voices. I will heal their land and I'll forgive their sins. That's not what's going on here. And so for us in America, we tend to use the same verse, especially around politically tense times or um, during the pandemic. We just need to get the church together to do this. And the problem is if we get the church together, If we get the church together to do this, all we're getting together is a righteous remnant, not the nation. This is national repentance, not simply a righteous remnant. What's going on here is different than what's going on today. And so we can't just take a verse because it's beautiful and pretty out of context and use it for today without building around it the beautiful realities that it does present. And so here's... Um, kind of what, uh, what they, they are. Um, this being for Israel's people, we who believe in Jesus Christ now in the New Testament have been grafted into Israel. And listen to me, I got some good news for you and I. You're not simply called his people, you're called his children. It, it, on top of that, which we'll get to in a moment, um, not only are we grafted in, but we're grafted in not in an obedience-based relationship with God, but a finished, a finished relationship through Jesus with God. Meaning that Jesus was completely obedient with perfection, went to the cross for you and I of our imperfection, gave his life so that we could have life. And because of our belief and trust in not only the crucified Jesus, but the resurrected Jesus, we are now children of God grafted into his family. And it's all based on his obedience, even in moments of my life when I'm not obedient. Listen, I, I don't know if we want to go back to the obedience-based relationship. Because what we'll soon find out is that maybe we're not as good as we think we are. But thank goodness that Jesus is gooder than we think he is. 
Like, I, what is going on in, in this text for us is just a little bit different. So let's, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you like four or five principles that I think are applicable to you and I. And, uh, and then end with another verse. And then we're going to approach God's, the Lord's table together. Um, um, let's look back at it again. Verse 14. If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven, forgive their sin and heal their land. It starts out with, if my people who are called by my name. Something unique and beautiful happened when Jesus arrived on the scene. You can look at it over and over again throughout the Old Testament of God's people finding themselves in a difficult, dark, bleak situation, and they call out to the Lord. They go astray for a while, and then they call out to the Lord, and he answers. Like You see this repetition throughout all of the Old Testament. Something unique happens when Jesus arrives on the scene, and he's asked, how do we pray? It is the first time, it's the first time in scriptures, it's the first time in human history that this occurs. All throughout the Old Testament, his people, God's people approached him by using different names that God had. But it was only at this moment, at this time in history, when Jesus said, this is how you pray, did he start off the prayer with, Father, everything changed in that one word. Because the way Israel approached God was as creator, as Lord of lords, as king of kings, as the great provider, as all of that, names of God. But only when Jesus arrives on the scene and through his perfect work, now can we approach the creator of the world as our father. That's different in a good way. No longer do you have to go to a temple setting with a sacrifice and a transactional relationship with the creator. Here's my sacrifice. Thank you for the forgiveness and move on. Now you and I can go into the family room, fall down on the floor and say, Father, help me. You all know parenting is difficult. You know the one, uh, man. Prior to being a pastor, moving up in the world, started out as a youth pastor, you know, small guy. Uh, I loved on teens like they were my own. I wanted to be a safe place for them to come and to be able to work through their their issues. And I devoted my time to that. And man, it was a beautiful season. And now um, now I have teenagers of my own. (laughs) And the only thing I want is for them to know that their daddy, no matter how dark, bleak, difficult the scenario or situation, their daddy is a safe place to be loved and embraced. And I don't think you fully can grasp the depth of the transition from approaching God as the creator to approaching him as the father. It changes everything. And so, yes, do we as his people approach him yet now? We absolutely do, but it goes in a different way. It's now in a beautiful family room setting where we can approach the creator of the world as our own intimate, beautiful, perfect, loving father. And the next thing that happens in this verse is if my people who call by my name humble themselves. Oh, man. If there's anything that we as American Christians need to get a little better at, is to be humble. 
And, and so, yes, we can't just rip this verse out of its context and prove something that it's not doing, but we sure can look at this. Okay, how, how did Israel approach God? This is how they approached God. They came in his name with humility, something that's needed. We need our hearts and minds reoriented towards the desires of God and his will. And the only way that that can happen so often is if you and I finally say, you know what, maybe I don't know all the answers. Maybe I've tried to control the scenario. Maybe I've tried to dictate what God can do and what he can't do. Maybe I've tried to convince him through my own desires and will to do things for me. And what I need to do is finally just stop, let go, and say, you're God, I'm not. And this situation around me looks like a bunch of locusts. I don't know why you sent them here. I'm not talking about you guys. I, just, I, I don't know why I'm wrestling with this. Why you have allowed this. But your ways are higher than mine. And your thoughts are higher than mine. And I trust you as my perfect, loving, good father. I don't like what you're doing, but I trust you. I think, I think we just need a lot more on our faces before him and a lot less trying to figure out all our, on our own. When we went to this church in Florida, one of the things that blew my mind uh, was their heart for prayer. They wrecked me. Did you know I grew up in church my entire life? I was birthed in church. Not, not really, but it felt that way. Every you, you, some of you know, every time the doors were open, you were there. I remember going to Awanas. Anyone remember Awanas? A few of you? Do you remember Sparky? I never got him. You know, the Sparky, the doll, like, I want, like you had to memorize verses and I was the dumb kid. I couldn't do it. I still want Sparky. Either way. I remember being at church my entire life. And it wasn't until, and my perspective might have changed, but it wasn't until I went to this church where I saw people actually be on their faces and their knees praying to the Father they so loved. They say the statistic is most churches spend about three minutes a week in prayer. <laughs> until you look around and realize that's true. Open with a prayer, sing a bunch of songs, pastor talks for too long, quickly pray and get out. I wonder, I wonder if part of our humility process is that we lay time aside and say, you are free to now work. My plans, my agendas, my longings, my desires, they are out the window, and I'm coming to you as my father asking you to work in a deep, beautiful way. So, so, if my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, it kind of tells me that in order to seek the face of the Lord, it took a turning away from the things they were facing. I wonder if it's why David said in Psalm 27, there's one thing I desire, one thing that I've asked, that I could sit and live in the temple all the days of my life and gaze upon the face of the Lord. It's that moment when you finally, I don't know if you've experienced this, and, and I don't like to talk a lot about experiences, but that moment where you finally get to see the Lord for who he is, and you just want to stay in that moment forever. What you behold, you become. And there's a moment at which if you're gazing at Jesus and you see his beauty and all that he is and you just want to stay there because in that moment, nothing else matters. But it's the moment that our gaze turns off of Jesus onto everything else around us. We get distracted, detoured, and devastated. And it seems like what God wanted his people to know all through their history is that when things get dark, when things get tough, here's what you need to do. Turn your eyes upon me. 
Why is this so hard to do? Anyone else here struggle with it? We're going to leave here in an hour and 40 minutes. And you're going to be like, maybe encouraged, maybe motivated, maybe conflicted with what you heard today, thinking deeply about what's going on, but how quickly will our minds and our thoughts and our eyes transfer from the glories of Jesus to the desires of our hearts? If my people who are called by my name humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven and I will forgive their sins and heal their land. What God is talking about in this moment, we see forgive sins and heal land, trying to figure out how does that fit together because God's purpose, his longings, his desires for his people was total, full restoration. Complete restoration, not just from forgiveness of your sins, but the healing of your land. He wanted them. It's almost like the purpose that God was developing was how can we get back to the garden? It was a long process for Israel. And I wonder, for you and I, is if we only want God to do the items that we have on our list, and then we're happy. He's like, no, I want to do something deeper than that. You've been hanging on to bitterness and anger for a long time. I I want to deal with that. Nah, that's, no. No, it keeps me going. Motivated. No, but you need to to deal with that. Like, like God doesn't want to just do a small work in our life. He doesn't want to just... uh, do the things that we think he should do. He, he wants to take your life and take you to places you never even dreamed of. Our relationship with Jesus was supposed to uh, allow us to enter into these deep places that every moment of every day we see something new, something beautiful that he's doing in our lives and that he's unfolding the lives of those around us. But we've been so one-dimensional anymore. We want to take this verse when times are tough, but we don't want to come to this verse every moment of every day seeking God's face saying, what do you want to do in my life today? And how can I show the power and presence of your spirit in this dark, gloomy world? How do we... How do we move from being in a transactional relationship with God to an intimate relationship with him? And I think that that's what this text is trying to get us to. Uh, But in order for us to see it, I want to take you to a place in the New Testament. We're going to do this verse and then I'll I'll be done. But if you would, turn to 1 John. Um, It's my des- desire this morning that we have time for communion and prayer at the end. So I'm going to take this verse and First John and we're going to work on it and then be done. First John chapter 1. Moving forward, John experiences Jesus firsthand. He engages In relationship with Jesus, he is there watching Jesus do the things that he did. He has a personal, intimate relationship with Jesus. And as he is getting older in life, he's like, I need to write some things down, inspired by the Holy Spirit. And this is what he says in verse 8 of chapter 1. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us, But verse 9, ready? If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we 
say we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar, and the word is not in us. Did you see this kind of conditional phrase here that we tend to use? If we say we have no sin, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins. This is right now showing you and I another approach to our Father, that Jesus Christ, the once for all perfect sacrifice, not only grafted us in to uh, Israel, to his family, but you and I, listen, can approach him regularly. But what about my sin? Because the way Israel had to do it in 2 Chronicles 7, 14 was to bring a sacrifice. What do, I, what do I need to do? The good news is that the once for all perfect sacrifice is Jesus Christ. How many of you know you sinned this past week? Two of you, okay, good. The rest of you got some work to do. There's not a moment that goes by where there's not something in our lives that God wants to deal with that we're saying, no, not this, but do with this. And what God wants to do is to bring us to or call to mind in our lives, in our hearts, in our minds, that there's more that he wants to do so we can now approach him. We can come to him. It's not a system. It's a relationship. It's, it's not transactional. It's intimate. We can approach God into his throne of grace, into the family room, and confess, listen, I've screwed up. I've messed up. I did all of this again and again. And it seems like in that moment that he says he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and cleanse us of us, our unrighteousness. What a beautiful verse, but it goes on as Sierra works her way up here. Look at verse uh, of chapter two, verse two. Now let's do verse one. My little children, I am writing these things to you so that you may not sin. <laughs> but if anyone does sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Do you know what's better than a temple? An advocate? Oh, you, okay. Um, if you were required to come here and offer sacrifices in order for your sins to be atoned and then leave, that would get pretty frustrating. But now, wherever you're at in this moment, if you have believed in Jesus Christ and you are a child of God, you have an advocate, meaning when you screw up, when you cut someone off on the road and they cuss you out and then you cuss them out, whatever, I don't know what you do, maybe you get angry, uh, and, and you're driving down uh, the road, it's in that moment, you go, man, God, I got some, it's not about the language I use, man, I got some anger in me I need you to deal with. And you have Jesus up there saying to the Father, he's mine. Jeremy, I know he's screwed up royally. He's mine. I know he didn't do that or he was supposed to do that. He's mine. I don't think we understand the powerful nature of an advocate. No longer does uh, God's people, his children, have to go to him through a priest. We go to him directly through the perfect blood sacrifice of Jesus, who now is alive and well, sitting at the right hand of the Father, advocating on our behalf. And I, and I think what this should do for you and I is not just come to him when things are falling apart, when the world doesn't make sense, and now humble yourselves and pray and seek his face. But maybe what this should do, if we truly understood what an advocate is, is every moment of every day, we are utterly grateful for Jesus doing something that we could not do. That thankfulness, that gratitude should never run out. There should be welling deep inside of us a thankfulness of, God, I don't deserve to be in your family room. I don't deserve to be in your presence. I don't deserve to be your child. But thanks be to Jesus Christ, my King, my Savior, and the lover of my soul. I want us go so much deeper into the realities that Jesus offers us. Where it's no longer about playing the games, 
but it's about intimacy with the Father, the creator of the universe through Jesus. And the way we get to do that, um, just to remember that, is we're going to take communion together. So here's what I'm going to have you do. If you would stand with me for a moment. The house lights will go out. Just close your eyes, bow your heads for a moment. And it's always been my longing and desire to move us from treating our relationship with God as consumer-driven or transactional, but truly understanding the intimacy that we have through Jesus. And I think that's what he wanted his disciples to grasp, too. So the, the night of his betrayal, he sat at this table with his disciples, and he passed around bread, and he said, this is my body, take and eat. And the reference of this is that this is his body that's going to be broken so that we can be made whole. And then he passes around a cup, and I'm sure the disciples in this moment thought this was weird and strange. He's instituting something new, but in that moment, he passes around this cup, and he says, uh, this is my blood, drink of it. And it was that moment where he's instituting this concept that it's only by his blood that we are washed clean. So by his body and by his blood, we have been set free and now have been welcomed into the family of God to be his children so that when we come together um, and take the bread and the juice, it's not all of this happening over again. It's a reminder of the gratitude that we have because of what Jesus Christ has done. And so there is great reason to celebrate because he has forgiven our sin, reconciled us back to God as our father and is our advocate for us right now. So what I'm going to ask is, as Sierra starts this song, when you feel led and ready, you can walk forward and take some juice and some bread and take it with your spouse, your family, take it together, pick it up and go to a corner, take it by yourself, however this works for you. But I want you to know in this moment, it's a reminder of the once for all perfect sacrifice of Jesus. reason why we can live and breathe and move. But then the other thing, if you want some prayer, we have some people that are going to come forward and are willing and ready to pray with you. Because the one thing that I know is I don't want to rush these moments where you can sing and worship and take communion and pray. Like I just think it's a moment where we can allow an intimacy to breed. So after I pray, the invitation is open. Father, we love you. We thank you for who you are and what you do. We thank you that we are your children and that you are our Father. And that it's by the perfect obedience of your Son that got us there. And so we lean in, we behold, we gaze at the beauties of Jesus. Thank you for listening to Crosslink Community Church Podcast. If you would like more information about our church, please visit our website at www.crosslinkchurch.com or join us in person on Sunday mornings at 1020 a.m. Don't forget to subscribe to our podcast so you don't miss a single message and share with a friend. Thank you again for listening.